of those monkeys growing up with non-maltreating mothers. When they get older, they play less than their counterparts. They're too busy trying to get in contact with their mother. And as they get older, they become more aggressive. And nice studies of these field populations have shown that they have deficits in serotonin metabolism. And we now know some, some ev really excellent work um, at Yerkes, cross-fostering studies by Dario Mastapieri initially, that these characteristics run in families and they're passed from one generation to the next by non-genetic pathways. Cross-fostering studies, monkeys fostered into abusive families grow up to be abusive mothers. Monkeys fostered out of abusive families to normal uh, families grow up to be normal parents. So there's cross-generational transmission of this characteristic. Now we've had a lab proxy for this sort of uh, model for many years, starting with Harlow, and that is to rear monkeys under social circumstances where they're not with their mother, but they have continuous contact with peers. And the paradigm is that these monkeys are separated from their mothers at birth, well before any kind of bond can be formed. They're hand reared in a neonatal nursery for the first month or so of life. And then they're put into small peer groups of four or five individuals where they grow up together 24 seven until they're about seven months of age. At seven months of age, they're moved into larger social groups that also contain their mother reared counterparts because that's the age in the wild where monkey mothers naturally wean their infants. And in the lab, that's where we move the inf infants out of their maternal situation into larger, more permanent peer groups and get ready for the next year's worth of infants. So this is a natural time to reconstitute the social groups. And from seven months on, mother-reared monkeys and peer-reared monkeys live in exactly the same physical and social environment. So if you see any differences along the line or later on, you can attribute those differences to what happened in that initial six months or seven months of life. And when you rear monkeys this way, they become hyper-attached to one another. Very strong attachments, but these attachments, while very strong, are probably dysfunctional because these monkeys spend an excessive amount of time clinging to one another instead of going out and starting to explore their environment. So their exploration is lower than normal, just like offspring of maltreating mothers. And when it gets time to the age where they should be starting to play, they do establish patterns of play, but it never reaches the level, the play never reaches the level of complexity or sophistication or intensity that you see in their mother reared counterparts. And when you think about it, it's not too surprising. They have to serve as attachment objects and playmates at the same time, and they don't do a very good job of either. When they get older, they become more fearful than normal, more anxious in challenging, novel challenging circumstances, like the offspring of maltreating mothers, and like the offspring of maltreating mothers that have higher levels of cortisol over the first two years of life under comparable challenge circumstances, whether you're measuring it in blood or saliva or in hair. When they get older, they also become more um, aggressive. Um, explosive types of aggression, again, like the offspring of maltreating mothers and like <clears throat> those offspring, they also show lower levels of serotonin metabolism, uh, whether you're looking in the first year of life when these levels are pretty high, but there's still a significant rearing condition difference, or later in life when the levels have dropped for everybody, but if anything, if anything, these levels, uh, the rearing condition difference has gotten bigger. There have been many, many studies of these monkeys during their juvenile years. We know there are some cognitive difficulties. There are some immunological dif differences between mother and, and uh, peer-reared monkeys. We just found out that there are telomere length differences. Peer-reared monkeys have shorter telomeres, um, even uh, in th the juvenile years, and those differences are maintained into adulthood. Uh, my colleagues in the Alcohol Institute have found in happy hour situations, uh, peer-reared monkeys drink more than their mother-reared counterparts. And we've done some neuroimaging over the years, and we found that their brains are different. Here's an early PET scan. It's about, it's about 10 years old. This was looking at serotonin binding potential in two-year-old monkeys who spent their first six months of life, seven months of life under different social conditions, but thereafter lived in the same groups. And what you see is for serotonin binding potential, a composite front view of a mother reared versus peer reared, composite top view of mother versus peer reared, composite side view of mother versus peer reared, and simple inspection suggests that the peer reared monkey's brains are not lighting up as much as their mother reared counterparts. And when you look at the actual data, you find that's exactly the case. 
whether you're looking at the fey, the thalamus, the striatum, the temporal or the frontal regions, fear-reared monkeys have significantly less serotonin binding potential than their mother-reared counterparts. We recently published a, a study looking at serotonin 1A receptor. Those uh, affinity patterns are different um, throughout the brain. We recently uh, finished a structural MRI study of three-year-old monkeys, and their brains are structured differently. There are significant structural differences in a variety of different parts of the, of the brain. I won't go into the details. So when you look at peer rearing, it has the effects, it has consequences not only for behavioral expression and emotional regulation, more fear, more aggression, for neuroendocrine function, higher levels of cortisol, for neurotransmitter metabolism, lower levels of serotonin metabolites, and even on brain structure and function. So these effects are ubiquitous <clears throat> across multiple levels of analysis and multiple measures, and <clears throat> in the absence of any kind of in intervention, they're fairly stable throughout the childhood years and into adulthood. And they resemble what you find in monkeys who grow up with maltreating mothers. Again, in the same of, uh, multi-dimensional ways at different levels of analysis. Now, recently, we've gotten into epigenetic studies looking at genome-wide patterns of both gene expression and methylation. The gene expression studies were done in collaboration with Steve Cole at UCLA, um, molecular biologist, and James Heck Heckman, a Nobel-winning, prize-winning economist from the University of Chicago. And what Steve does is he looks at gene expression in leukocytes, a type of white blood cell. And what you're seeing here is a paper from a paper we published a couple years ago, is a heat map of monkeys differentially reared at four months of age. So they're still in their differential rearing condition. And I'll walk you through the graph. Every vertical line is a different gene. Every horizontal line is a different monkey. So it's mother reared, mother reared, mother reared, mother reared, mother reared, peer reared, peer reared, peer reared, peer reared. If you see red, that gene is overexpressed. If you see green, that gene is underexpressed. And what you see is virtually no overlap between rearing conditions for over 2,000 genes. If it's red and mother reared, it's green and peer reared. If it's green and mother reared, it's red and peer reared. With one exception, those of you with sharp eyes can see that MR55 is mother reared, but its profile looks like a peer reared monkey. Well, surprise, surprise, MR55's mother was a maltreating mother. So on that N of one, we get a proof of principle of the point I was trying to make earlier. Now, what do these genes do? Well, I can't tell you, but Steve Cole can. And some of the differences are, he's summarized in this slide, monkeys who are period um, have more expression of genes associated with inflammation, with cell growth and differentiation, with transcription control. Monkeys, uh, period monkeys, have lower than normal levels of expression for immunoglobulin pro production, type 1 interferon, antiviral response, antibacterial response as well, and glucocorticoid um, system differences. So you could say, well, that's nice, but what does it mean? Well, Steve Cole's day job is to do uh, expression studies in humans. And some years ago, he published with John Cassiopo, a brilliant social psychologist, neuro social neuroscientist from University of Chicago, a study of adult humans who characterize themselves as either being lonely or socially well integrated. And if you look at the profiles of the lonely individuals, those genes that are underexpressed, you know, I'll be production, type 1, interferon, antiviral response, and those that are overexpressed, inflammation, cell growth, etc., they're exactly what you see in the peer reared monkeys. Now, I'm not about to stand up here and tell you that peer reared monkeys are just like people who consider themselves uh, socially isolated, but you have to admit that, that the patterns are strikingly similar, and I'll get back to that at a later point. So the other set of studies we've been doing is with a McGill group, uh, Michael Meany's ex-collaborator, Moshe Ziff. He studies methylation. You've heard quite a bit about methylation. You're simply adding methyl groups to these, these uh, sites. And Moshe, we published a study with Moshe's lab a couple years ago looking at genome-wide methylation patterns in adult monkeys who had been differentially reared. Eight years of age, fully adult, they had spent the first six or seven months under 
different rearing conditions, but thereafter we're in the same situation. Here's a younger Moshi, by the way. He has a little less hair at this point. And what he does is, let me walk you through this part of the gra uh, uh, a graph. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't show the other chromosomes, but these are uh, from tissue obtained postmortemly in prefrontal cortex, and these are um, another type of white blood uh, cell uh, lymphocytes collected at exactly the same point in time. And if the bar, each bar that you see is a gene, if it's above the line, it's significantly more methylated in mother reared. If it's below the line, it's significantly less, me more methylated in pure reared. And if you go throughout the entire genome, there are over 4,400 genes that are differentially methylated, both in prefrontal cortex and in lymphocytes. Now that's one fourth of the entire rhesus monkey genome. That is a hell of a lot of genes. Furthermore, and I won't go into what they're doing, furthermore, um, there is some tissue specificity, but for about 30% of those 4,400 genes, the same genes are methylated in exactly the same direction in both prefrontal cortex and in, in white, cell white blood cell lymphocytes. So at least for some genes, there is complete correspondence between what's going on in the brain methylation-wise and what's going on in the, these peripheral measures. Now, of course, what's crucial is what are those, what is, are those 30 percent of the genes? What are they doing? And that's a uh, subject for another presentation. And just to summarize the finding of that first study, these genes who showed particular patterns of methylation, particular rearing condition effects, um, tended to be both closely linked in function and closely linked in position on chromosomes. So they were sitting right next to each other and they were part of this, generally part of the same gene systems, sort of what um, Michael had been talking about earlier. Now in both the Cole project and the Moshe Ziff project, we have followed up these one-shot studies with longitudinal data and we now have a completely uh, completed data set of samples, blood samples collected um, from monkeys differentially reared at one, at one, two weeks, four weeks, two months, six months, and every six months thereafter until they reach puberty. And the, some of the monkeys were mother reared and some were peer reared for that first six or seven months. So we have now a longitudinal record. <clears throat> Those data are presently under analysis, but I can tell you right now, the data are not quite ready for prime time, that when you keep the situation stable, these differences are maintained. As soon as you start changing the social situation, the patterns of methylation and expression change, and if you change it in a more therapeutic direction, they start converging. So these genetic markers, whether they be gene expression or methylation, can be modified by environmental interventions um, just as the behaviors can be modified and the HPA axis can be modified. And we have some pilot data that I can share with you. These are data where our intervention involved when these monkeys were first put together in their new social groups, reconstructed social groups at seven months of age. It's usually pretty chaotic because you have a bunch of strange youngsters going, to get, going together and no adults to, to monitor with the activity. So we started adding to these new groups what we call foster grandparents, a post-reproductive age female who had a history of very nurturing relationships, not only with her own kids, but with the kids in the, in the group. And uh, she was there to s provide support for those youngsters who were a little skittish and needed some help. And then we had old adult males who also had a history of positive interactions with youngsters, not all males do. Uh, these guys would play with males, younger males, a lot in their earlier days, and they wouldn't tolerate aggression. So when these youngsters started getting rambunctious, they'd break up fights, they'd keep the peace. So here's one of them. This is Doogie. And I can assure you, nobody's going to mess with Doogie. <laughs> so when you do that, some interesting things happen. Here are data. These are just simply the number of genes that are differentiated, differentially methylated at one month of age when the monkeys are still in the nursery or with their mother. And for both males and females, 5,000 genes, again, a quarter of the, of the genome, the entire genome, are differentially methylated. These are lymphocytes. Intervention happens here at about seven months, and by two years of age, look what has happened. Now for the males, it's not 5,000 anymore, it's 2,500. It's half of what it was, and the general pattern has been the methylation patterns in the peer-reared monkeys have 
come to resemble more closely those of their mother reared counterparts. They're becoming normalized. It's, now, 2,500 genes is still an awful lot, but it's half of what it was at one month. And look at the females. It's not 5,000. It's not 2,500. It's 750. It's one-eighth of what it was at the first month of life. So what's happening at the end of the second year for females? Well, one of the things that's happening is they're having the very first stirrings of pubertal change. And it may be that the onset of puberty has a total rearrangement that this represents a window of opportunity for uh, in, in increased plasticity of the system to the point where you may have some of those earlier patterns overridden by changes associated with puberty. Now, the proof in the pudding is what happens at age three for the males, because males, like in humans, are behind females in their rate of maturation. So by three years, they should be in the same pubertal state as the females at two. And the question is, do they change? And our preliminary analyses, not quite yet ready for prime time yet, but there, suggests that they do. So in fact, we may be looking at another very important sensitive period of maximal possibility for changes, not only in behavior and physiology and body characteristics or their social world, but also in their patterns of gene expression and methylation. So <clears throat> these systems are plastic and can be modified by external social events. Now I want to go back to our story about dominance hierarchies and tell you another source of early life adversity and that is being low ranking. As I mentioned, there are hierarchical differences between families such as you have high ranking families with high ranking mothers and high ranking offspring and low ranking families with low ranking mothers and low ranking offspring. And I can tell you in a rhesus monkey group, it's very different to be high ranking as opposed to be low, low ranking and low ranking can be arguably as powerful a chronic stressor as any kind of mal mal uh, maternal maltreatment. So uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a very low ranking mother with a six week old infant. And as the video starts, there's a fight breaking out on the, to the right of the screen. And the infant wants to go check it out. Mother cannot afford to let her infant go because if it gets in trouble, she doesn't have the clout to rescue it. So look what she does. There's the infant looking. Mother is looking around frantically, grabs the infant, grabs a flower, distracts the infant. Meanwhile, the fight, members of the fight are clearing out, She's still looking around, engages in face-to-face -face contact with the infant. Now, checks out the coast is clear. It's okay for the infant to go and explore. She even gives it a little push. And now she goes and follows it just to make sure everything is cool. Now that is one cool mother. And that is one secure attachment relationship. But she's low ranking. She's got to do all this stuff because her, she has no social clout and she knows it and she can't afford to let her infant get into trouble. So she's got to regulate its behavior and monitor it much more closely. Here's a high ranking mother with a 19 day old infant. She's not looking, no, in extended face to face interactions. She's not looking at anywhere else. She doesn't have to. She knows that nobody's going to bother her or them. Um, and so it's a different world. So if you look at what are the consequences of low social, social status, well, behaviorally, you have restrictions on your social activities and, access, and access to resources. In a place like Poolsville, where there's plenty of food for everybody, that's not an issue, but in the wild it sure can be. You have better access to shelter. You're going to be less likely to be on the periphery of a troop getting picked off by predators. It's chronic stress. Unpredictability, unpredictability of social initiations by others. So you can be merrily doing your business, and some rambunctious adolescent male from a high-ranking family can jump you and start harassing you. Or worse, you can have your infant stolen by adolescent females of higher ranking families. Biologically, we already know that these monkeys have, have uh, chronically high levels of HPA activity as monitored by hair cortisol. And health-wise, we started looking at our veterinary records. That was James Hexman's 
suggestion. They have higher injury rates, more veterinary, more veterinary interventions and treatments. They have immune system vulnerability, excessive inflammation, high incidence of GI disorders, the monkey equivalent of diarrhea, shigella, much higher incidence in these low-ranking animals. So it's a crummy life, and it's stressful. So what about their genes? Well, we know that A, um, daughters have the same social status, at least initially, as their mothers. And by the way, they um, pass that on to the next generation. And we know from nice studies by a group, very recent studies by Jenny Tung's group uh, at Yerkes, that the high dom low dominance is associated with a very different uh, genome-wide profile, um, methylation profile, than high dominant status. And if you experimentally alter dominant status, the profiles change, consistent with the change in social status. So the methylone is sensitive to status differences and current status, social position status. And their newborn infants, at least by two weeks of age, share the same patterns, at least developmentally adjusted. So about two years ago, and it's just assumed that this transmission is social, that it's as much a re reaction of other monkeys in the group, so here's an offspring of a high-ranking female. We're not going to mess with that offspring. Or here's an offspring of a low-ranking female. We can ignore it or beat it up or anything like that. Um, it's a very different world they grow up in. So about two years ago, Moshe Ziff said, Steve, why don't you start placenta, uh, collecting placentas? And I said, what do you want placentas for? And he said, just wait. So we started collecting placentas. And here, for those of you that know, remind you what a placenta is, here's a start of the third trimester fetus, here's the head, the eye, here's the umbilical cord, umbilical cord comes all the way down here and ends somewhere in that mess in a placenta. And so it's a fetal tissue, and its job is to be the gatekeeper of stuff coming from the mother via the umbilical cord. Nutrients, for sure, um, uh, maybe uh, stress hormones and other things. Um, we know from elegant work with sheep and other animals that the placenta makes decisions, if that's the right word to use, about what brain, what body part or tissue organ system gets what resources. So on tight times, maybe they shunt extra resources to the brain and the cardiovascular system. Um, in other circumstances, maybe more to skeletal muscles, uh, things of that sort. So the placenta has to be sensitive to what's going on with the mother to pass that information on and to filter it for the, for the fetus. So I said high-ranking females have different patterns of methylation, uh, at least in lymphocytes and low-ranking females, and their kids do as well. Turns out that there are high-ranking placentas and low-ranking placentas. So here's another um, heat map. Here, blue is, is um, significantly less methylated than normal. Red is significantly more methylated with normal. Here, now every horizontal line is a gene, and here every vertical line is a monkey. So he, these are the high-ranking females, and these are the low-ranking females. And what you see, again, is almost complete zero overlap across dominant status. Um, and about the same order of magnitude, number of genes are differentially methylated in these placentas, as you see, in differentially reared infants um, or infants with maltreating mothers. So the number of genes affected by this status situation is about the same as the number of genes that are affected if you grow up in a nursery and are put into peer groups. And many of the genes are the, exactly the same as what you see in these rearing condition studies. So here um, are the genes that we saw that Steve Hull reported were differentially expressed in four-month-old infants, and many of these same systems you can pick up in the placentas as well. So here is a biological mechanism by which social status, a social characteristic, can be transmitted from one generation to the next. So what do we do with this? Where does this go? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can manipulate social status experimentally. It's not that hard to do. It's a lot easier than trying to reverse the effects of early experience, and you can do it any time during development. So, for example, you can have a high-ranking female who has one kid, 